Hey guys, the video you're watching right now is a production from The Remnant Radio. You'll notice uh, uh, myself, Michael Roundtree, and Michael Miller are not the co-host of this program on Tuesdays. On Tuesdays, we are covering church history. Here on Remnant Radio, we want to cover theology, church history, and the gifts of the Spirit. But none of us are patristic scholars, but we know some. Uh, in fact, the scholars that we interview frequently on church history, we have empowered to make weekly content here on Remnant Radio. So for the next 12 weeks, Josh Hoffert, Father Ron Drummond, and Matthew Escobar are going to be your guides through the early church fathers as they tackle this patristic period of history uh, that we are calling Back to the Fathers. And uh, speaking of Father Ron Drummond, he wears that clerical collar he every does. single week. And I think he needs something new. Yeah. We are he entirely crowdfunded. And if you donate to the Remnant Radio, perhaps we could afford to Another provide shirt. Father Ron Drummond with a new shirt. Solid. So uh, that is speaking of us being a crowdfunded ministry. We are. I want to invite you to uh, to contribute. If you've benefited in any way from Remnant Radio's content, uh, two ways that you can do that. You can click on the link for PayPal or Patreon. PayPal is for a one-time donation. Patreon is for a recurring donation once a month for as little as $5 a month. And we provide you with exclusive content that Josh and I come up with as well as uh, some of our other contributors. So I want to invite you guys to do that. Consider donating. And now stay tuned for Back to the Fathers. Welcome, everybody, to Back to the Fathers. I'm Matthew Esquivel here, and we are looking forward to another great episode today led by Josh Hoffert. This is a continuation of last week, but if you missed last week, you can still just jump right in with us today. We'll, uh, we'll do a little review, pick up where we left off, and then we'd encourage you to go check out these previous episodes. We're in episode eight of a 12-part series right now called Back to the Fathers, and we're looking at this month, we are wrapping up our discussion on the Christology of the early fathers. So pay close attention. Um, we encourage you to like, to subscribe, and to comment on this video. So if this has benefited you, if it's blessed you, please like it. Please share it with a, um, on, your, on your social media. Please subscribe so you can be up to date on upcoming episodes. And then put your comments in the box. If you're watching us live right now, we'd really love to uh, the opportunity to address some of your questions. So um, please fill those out in the comment box. I'm gonna kick it over to Father Ron here, and he's gonna give us a little heads up on what we can expect to see in these coming weeks on Back to the Fathers. Father Ron. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, so as we finish up our series on the Christology of the Church Fathers, which is to say how they uh, how they looked at the person of Christ, uh, we're going to move into uh, the last part of our 12-part series, uh, looking at how the Fathers viewed the world in general, uh, like their sacramental worldview. Uh, how did they view nature and matter and the material world? Uh, how did they view the relationship between earth and heaven, between the spiritual and the material? And how did they deal with things like uh, mystical visions and miracles and uh, maybe even some demonology in there as well? So uh, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, we're looking forward to diving into that as well and hope that you are too. Uh, but for now, like Matthew said, we are going to continue our discussion uh, where we left off last week with the controversy between uh, Nestorius and Cyril, uh, which flows naturally into uh, another discussion about the natures of Christ. Uh, so, Joshua, why don't you get us going there? I would love to get us going. Well, you know, Matt Esquivel. He already got us going, so um, now we will <laughs> now we will continue going, and um, so uh, yeah, you know the the discussion of not I don't we don't want to rehash all the all the stuff we have gone over, um, mm -hmm. but just very briefly where we ended last week uh, was what seemed like the the Council of Ephesus. Uh, and the argument between the Alexandrian bishops and the Antiochian bishops represented by Nestorius and uh, by Cyril uh, seemed to have come to some resolution with the formula of union. And uh, you'd think that, uh, okay, now we've kind of, we've, we've had this debate. John of Antioch sat down with Cyril of Alexandria. Just a side note to that, I was listening to a podcast today 
and they referred to John Chrysostom as John of Antioch. And I was like, oh my goodness, they're the same people. But then I realized, no, they are not. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> yes, but, but my mind was almost blown. I was like, what the heck? This was John Chrysostom the whole time? But no, hmm. never mind. Um, no, no. They paraded John yeah. Chrysostom's grave into, <laughs> into Constantinople, I think, sometime after. <laughs> after I had just never, I had never heard Chrysostom mm -hmm. referred to as John of Antioch. So, yeah. Um, uh, so anyway, Cyril and John of Antioch has co have come together and they've tried to put together a, a description of uh, the inner workings of the, the divine and the human union, giving language that would make the Antiochians happen, happy, giving language that would uh, make the Alexandrians happy and um, and reaffirming the the role of the Theotokos and that that is actually something that we can say, the God bearer, um, Mary, the mother of God. So um, their, their, their resolution really left most people unhappy, if you can put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it left a few. It left enough people happy while they were while Cyril and John of Antioch were still alive. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there we go. Yes, but, uh, that's right. Yeah. But once they were gone, all of the all of the pin up emotions came out in an intense way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, and the Alexandrians weren't happy uh, that Cyril was okay leaving the language of that Christ was of two natures uh, in the formula of union and. Um, the or the Alexandrians weren't happy with that. They wanted to see one nature language in there, and the Antiochians weren't happy with how Nestorius was treated in the first place, and so they always felt like they got a bad rap. So right. what, what the in in just, terms of what? Go ahead, go ahead. If I yeah, if I can just back up and just for those maybe that didn't join us last week. So just the the Antiochians, the Antiochian Christians, that'd be modern day Syria. So you've got the Syrian Christians of the fifth century, and then the Alexandrian. Christians. Uh, they were in Egypt, Alexandria, Egypt. These were two very important seats of, of Christendom um, in the fifth century. And um, as we talked about last week, that um, you had a strong emphasis from a lot of the Antiochian or Syrian Christians on these two natures of, of Christ, the divine and the human. Um, the concern last week was that Nestorius' strong emphasis on these two natures it sounded like you had two sons, you had two Christ, you had two two you had you had two <laughs> two persons going on here and so cyril and the alexandrians put a real strong emphasis i know we have one person here um and uh they would use the word nature but a lot more carefully and and would prefer the term one incarnate nature um, but as josh hoffer as you pointed out you know as they're trying to sort this out they're trying to come to an agreement here in the formula of union they mentioned this key phrase that in, at the incarnation, they want to say, yes, it's one person. Yes, we can call Mary the God bearer because Jesus is fully God. He's, he's a divine word. But this phrase for a union of two natures has been accomplished. That's, that's what you're talking about. That's what Josh is talking about when he says yeah. that this, this, this made some of the Alexandrian or the Egyptian Christians very unsettled. <laughs> so, yeah. And they, 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 it left them suspect uh, because mm -hmm. what well, I mean, what's going back and forth, of course, is one swing of heresy to the next is really is really it. The church is working on ironing out a balanced Christological view. And mm -hmm. um, and how do we communicate that? And how do we use how do we have language that that um, evens the playing field, so to speak? We, we know what we can talk about. We know how we can talk. And um, and this is the kind of language that we can use. And uh, unfortunately, the formula of union did not finalize that. And, and by no means at, at this point, when we get to the Council of um, Chalcedon, by no means does that end the arguments. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it is a real, it is quite a demarcation point in terms of church history when it comes right. to uh, how, how the nature of Christ was understood. And you, you still have splintering splintering denominations, if you will, splintering uh, uh, deviations from that. And, you know, if we had a hundred weeks, we could go through each one of those, but we don't have that. So uh, right, 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 right. Our, our final right. resting place for our conversation yeah. on uh, early church Christology. But right. it is and, you interesting, know, I, it yeah, is interesting ahead, to note, though, again, without getting into everything, that um, the schisms that arose uh, after the Council of Chalcedon uh, are still with us today. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the Christian groups, yeah. the ancient Christian groups that refused to uh, accept that council uh, are still alive and well. 
uh, around the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think it's it's helpful to say too, just this whole thing, what's what's the point of all this? Is this just a bunch of councils and debates? It's it's a it's a serious theological reflection and attempt to understand John 114, the word became flesh. <laughs> you know what? Um, it's an attempt to make sense of Philippians 2 that he though being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave. So we see in the scripture that there is a um, a strong emphasis on this union of of the word becoming flesh of the form of God in the form of slave that you have Christ who is divine and human but how how divine how human what is the, what what is the how do we understand the contact between divinity and humanity in the person of Christ and what Cyril and his camp were uh, that Josh did a great job of discussing last week was to really emphasize we've got we we have one person going we don't have two persons we don't have like the son of god is one separate person and then you know the son of david jesus of nazareth as a as a separate person um we got one one lord jesus christ who is the word of god and who is the son of david the son of mary and the union is a it's a substantial union meaning union of mm -hmm. substance as opposed to uh, just a union of wills between between the two natures, uh, right? Right. They sort of so come to like a, a mutual and, agreement, right? So it's not like the joining of a husband and wife; they become one. They become right. one flesh, or even our oneness with the Lord. I when I you know it says in the scriptures that um, when we are joined to the Lord, we become one spirit um, with the Lord. And so, but I still have Matthew, and there's still Christ in me, you know, <laughs> dwelling in my heart by faith, dwelling in me by the Holy Spirit. But we still have two different persons, two different hypostases going on here. We've got Matthew and we've got God. Um, but we're uh, we're trying to affirm we're, we're what the scriptures say and what the Nicene Creed has said. One Lord Jesus Christ. We want to make sure that we're maintaining that. Yeah, and and these these the arguments here. It, it's interesting how it, Ephesus and Chalcedon. Um, preserving the faith of Nicaea was of utmost importance. That's the first thing that they read out of off both the councils is this is the Nicene Creed and this is what we affirm as the correct formula for the faith. And, right. and so th this is of utmost importance. Both of those councils are going, how do we, how does, how do we uphold the teachings that we codified in Nicaea? And for, for Ephesus, of course, they add the letters of Cyril to say, this is the way that we should understand Nicaea. Uh, and and essentially in Chalcedon, they're going to add the Tome of Leo to say um, to further. This is how we understand um, uh, the issue of uh, well, Cyril addressing Nestorianism, and as we get into it, Leo um, addressing you. Uh, how do you you to you to Eutychianism, right? Yeah, Eutyche oh. but Eutychianism would be the Eutychianism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right, right, right. These, these yeah, terms, you get there's, just, back there. there's so many of them. <laughs> Why can't they just right. be named like Bill and Pete? Yeah, Bill, <laughs> and John, and that's right. Yes, Johnism. Right, that would be much right. easier. That's right. Yeah. So, Josh Hoffert, we so last week we ended on the formula of union. A union of two natures has taken place, as you mentioned. There were a lot of Alexandrians that were um, that were still uncomfortable with that language. There was a sense yeah. of unity that was maintained while Cyril of Alexandria and John of Antioch were still alive. But this right. week, these guys are dead. Um, we got new people um, in charge where they used to be in charge. And some of this controversy breaks out. Another council is called. So what 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 leads up to this council um, of, of Chalcedon and um, who are the main players in it? And what are they? What are they arguing about now? Yeah, well, I think a word, just a word about Cyril before he passes away. Um, mm -hmm. That that I think, uh, you know, I one of the things I said last week when we were talking about uh, was just just criticizing how how these guys went about um, uh, arguing this out, and there right. probably would have been a better way. But the thing you do see with Cyril is as as a uh, he really does try and accommodate the uh, Antiochian uh, bishops, right. and uh, and he really does try and work a union between you know quote unquote the two sides, 
Um, so you don't see Cyril continuing to be very divisive as he was originally with Nestorius. So it looks like there's a softer approach in Cyril later in his life. And, and then when you get into Cyril's book, um, and I think I may have flashed this one last time on the unity of Christ, uh, mm. you, you really see him actually even using some of the, the language that uh, the bishops of Antioch would have used when um, he would have been less... He's he's he he in his initial letters he talks more about one nature and in on the unity of Christ he talks much more uh, using the two nature language, um, and and so you do see him softening his his stand probably because of his friendship with John of Antioch and I do really appreciate that about Cyril that mm -hmm. what you can see early in his life is a, a the kind of this flair for the for, flair for the dramatic and. Uh, some, some, definitely some political intrigue going on here, and some power struggle and that kind of stuff. But, but I do really appreciate the way that he came as a unifying presence to the church. In his, that was his, that was his goal. So what right. happens is Cyril passes away. Cyril, Cyril, and his whole family have become very influential in all of Christendom at this point. Um, and and Cyril, he passes away. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I can't remember the exact date that he passes away, but it, it's in between 430 and 448. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Matt, you know, the, the, I think the it's 444. That think. Okay. That, yeah. So the successor to, as the Bishop of Alexandria is a man named Di, uh, Dioscorus. Um, and Dioscorus is not nearly as <laughs> um, theologically savvy as Cyril will say. Uh, and he he really doesn't like the formula of union. And so Dioscorus begins doing everything he can to undo what Cyril has done. And he he basically kicks all of Cyril's family out. Cyril, Cyril's family for 60 years had been one of the most influential families there. He kicks most of Cyril's family out of the various different uh, public service uh, positions that they're in. And he's very unhappy with the formula of union and, and really does a lot of work to try and undo what Cyril was working towards. And around this time, what, what comes up is a, um, a, a priest monk, uh, which I figured out this time finally what an Archimandrite was, if that's how you say that. I could be totally wrong. <laughs> the Archimandrite, uh, yeah. Archimandrite, mm -hmm. Archimandrite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is betraying my, uh, <laughs> uh, my knowledge of Eastern Orthodox terminology. Um, the uh we've always got one we've always got one guy in the comments though who who knows all those he's things. gonna so call i know if, he's gonna call if you're there out, dude right. just put the pronunciation just sound it out there you go yeah sure we got it right. right yeah why do you put an <laughs> i in there then if it's archman archmandrite oh Man. okay maybe i'm yeah. saying it wrong uh, <laughs> well chances are you're saying it right and i'm saying it wrong we'll just go that way so so the, um so a, a named eutychus um eutyches eutyches and mm -hmm. um, he's this Eutyches is a, a respected guy. He's not a prolific writer, author, um, even a prolific speaker in that sense. Um, he's really, I mean, we're actually reconstructing what Eutyches believed and taught is only, it's one of those things where it's really only done based on all the people that disagreed with him. And um, so he is, his name is really remembered in history mainly because of the controversy that he stirred up, not because of any great contribution he had in terms of written, written, uh, uh, written letters and, and such. I mean, <laughs> the, the fact that, we, that Leo's letters are preserved so well, Leo the, the Pope at the time are preserved so well, is why we have some of what Eutyches, uh, what happened to Eutyches and what he said. Right. So um, a little, if you want to be famous in history, either cause a major controversy or... <laughs> solve it <laughs> yeah yeah there you go he caused he caused the major controversy yeah and um what what Eutyches did was that he he basically swings almost all the way back in his language to uh, apollinarism which we talked about a few episodes ago uh matt matt had presented that one very well where he begins talking about the there he will confess that there are two natures before the incarnation there's one nature after the incarnation. And so this is where it's the, the, the Alexandrians get frustrated because the, the language of two natures um, is it, it or, or the Antiochians get frustrated because the language where it goes of two natures can lend itself to 
okay, well, he was of two natures. Now he is of one nature. And so you can really start to read into these things, which is what Eutyches does. He begins to teach that Christ pre, pre-incarnation was two natures and a- after incarnation was one nature. And, and also um, what that seems to imply and almost directly implies is that if he was of two natures prior to the incarnation, then the body that he assumed he had trouble saying that that body was the same as ours because how could he mm-hmm. be of the same of two natures prior to the incarnation if the fleshly body he assumed was fully human and so he won't go as far as to say that the body of christ was a heavenly body but but he just seems confused in his language and mm-hmm. I, you know on i was thinking about this today honestly at this point it it's like an early church example of cancel culture it's like, oh no, if I say the wrong thing, someone's going to get mad at me. And so he's yeah. just constantly trying to weigh behind, between what he, say, what he yeah. says and, uh, and uh, go ahead if anybody wants to pipe right. in there. Father Ron, did you have something you want to add there? No, I, I was just agreeing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think I'd add that, you know, that's again to, to Josh, your point, the Antiochians, they wanted to incorporate the use of that term two natures to emphasize that we have everything that it takes to be God and everything that it takes to be human in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, whereas, you know, you had Apollinarius that we talked about a couple of weeks ago um, that he affirmed that the word of God took on flesh, but he denied that Jesus Christ had a, had a, a rational human soul or human mind. Um, right. And so when the, that had been stamped out back in 381 at the Council of Constantinople, but now we're back here, um, almost not quite, but almost 100 years later, and um, we've got this l- language of two natures. But then we have people like Eutychus that are saying, "No, you know, there was there was two natures before, but now only one." It's it's suggesting that somehow the human nature got subsumed by the divine, right? Or that the divine was somehow lessened during that union of divinity and humanity. And it's, and, and we've got some kind of hybrid nature going on. So we don't really have true God or true man. We have kind of, you know, mostly God with, you know, walking around in a dead body suit, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, he almost, he, al- he didn't create a new heresy, but he, he unwittingly became the, the, uh, his name was uh, interchangeable with, um, uh, became interchangeable with the heresy that talked about, and I'm blanking on the actual heretical name where um, uh, it's not myophytism or monophytism. It's something somewhere in there. It's me. Uh, right. it, yeah. It's, it's is it me- miaphysite. Miaphysite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There right. we go. Yeah. Right. Uh, at the time, so- at the time it was called monophysite. Um, modern day, like Coptic, Christians, for example, or, or others that, you know, reject the Council of Chalcedon, they, um, historically, they preferred the term miaphysite. Um, but, uh, but in the history books, it was monophysite, the one nature people, the one nature folks. Right. <laughs> so he, I don't, I don't, if you, if, because Leo presses Eutychus in, in his, in the letters back and forth. And right. it seems like in, when you read the, when you read Eutychus's responses, and what he writes to what he writes to Leo, and what he claims happens at the council, which we'll get into in a second, um, the the local council is called um, to to investigate his teachings. Um, he he seems willing to amend his language um, hmm. to a certain degree, and uh, you know there's certain things he comes hard up against. But again, he comes across as just someone that's confused about what language is the right language. So to have his name again ends up becoming synonymous with, as, as we said, the, um, those two, what, what we would term as heresies, but, um, you know, technically under Orthodox traditional Trinitarian theological belief structure. Um, but there's definitely some strains of the church out there that would call us heresies based on right. what we believe. Um, so anyway, uh, so what happens is, uh, Eutychus is teaching these things and, uh, saying some problematic things. So, um, a, a, a priest named Eusebius begins to call him out on this and he partners with Flavian. Flavian is the Bishop of Constantinople. 
And Flavian and, and Eusebius are really concerned about what Eutychus is teaching because Eutychus' teaching is confusing the people. They've, you know, they've, we've dealt with this at the Formula of Union. We met, we met at the Council of Ephesus. Flavian was firmly um, uh, in support of the, uh, the Formula of Union and Cyril's uh, Christology. So, uh, so he's, he finds it really problematic. And Flavian's, probably Flavian's worst, worst, uh, mistake in the whole thing is, um, ass- you know, in this is me reading between the lines, but is assuming the position of condemning and ostracizing Eutyches before consulting Leo. And, um, and so he writes to Leo and uh, Eutychus write- writes to Leo because at this point they've anathematized uh, Eutychus, they've looked at his teachings. Uh, in when Eutychus writes to Leo, he basically says, these guys didn't give me a fair shake whatsoever. I was completely compliant and I wrote letters to them. And I, I said that I'm willing to adopt the, the right Christological language or Christological language. Um, and, uh, and then Flavian comes back and writes to Leo and says, this dude's an absolute liar. (laughs) He's there's, he absolutely did not say this. He absolutely did not do this. He didn't even show up for the meetings. And we we <laughs> investigated him very thoroughly, and we found his stuff very problematic. And and so they pushed back on uh, in in their interview with him. They pushed back on his language of um, uh, two natures and one nature. And and he he had a hard time letting go. At first, he claims that he's changed, but then he goes right back to using the same language when he's teaching his people. And so there, they just don't trust him at this point, Eutychus. Um, And so they anathematize him. They send all of his, all the documents to Leo, who's the Pope. This is happening at, um, in that interim 444, I think it's 448 where this is happening. And um, Leo investigates, Leo reads all of their documents and he sides with Flavian and Eusebius against Eutychus and said, and says, this is really problematic. And in the midst of this, he writes what, what we referenced last episode is the Tome of Leo. Uh, which becomes one of the key documents for the Council of uh, Chalcedon and the the key document for understanding um, how to think properly when it comes to um, the 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 two natures, um, you know, as opposed to the division of the two natures, but the union of the two natures. And how do we, you know, Cyril talks about how we deal with the division of the two natures in Nestorius, and Leo talks about how we deal with the with the union of the two natures. How do we have language around that? Um, mm-hmm. And so that that is codified at the Council of uh, Chalcedon, but that's the Tome of Leo is the response to Eutychus's problematic statements. Um, and... Uh, so what happens is uh, Eutychus appeals to, um, uh, oh, where is the, you know, I've got it somewhere in here. Um, who does he appeal to, guys? Help me there. To Dioscorus. Dioscorus. Yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah. He appeals to Dioscorus. Right, right. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. The Bishop of Alexandria, these, yes. These um, names, these are, they, these names, I, I feel like I'm in the Hunger Games. You know, there's just these really <laughs> bizarre, <laughs> yeah. of course, Hunger Games pulls a lot of names <laughs> yeah. from like <laughs> early Roman Greek culture. So. Um, there's, there's our first, uh, there's our first, uh, pop culture reference in the episode today. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and so he appeals to Dioscorus and, and says, Hey, these guys, Dioscorus has already doesn't like, uh, Flavian's position because he disagrees with the formula of union. So he's already favorable to Eutychus, even if Eutychus has problematic, um, problematic language in in how he approaches these things, Dioscorus uses the opportunity and he calls a council and uh, refuses to incorporate Leo's tome, a, a local council, refuses to incur- incorporate Leo's letter refuting um, the the uh, heresy of Eutychus, and uh, he condemns and deposes Flavian and everybody that agrees with the formula of union. Like this is his this is his political power play. Where he goes, right. all right, we're going to be able to get rid of this now, and we're going to use this situation as an opportunity to do that. Right. Uh, so just to just to be clear here too, we've got so we've got Dioscorus of Alexandria. He's a successor of Cyril. So Cyril has died some years earlier. Yes. And Cyril has been helping maintain unity between the Egyptian and the Syrian bishops. 
Um, but now Dioscorus is in power. Dioscorus wasn't a fan of that formula of union that said a union has taken place, a union of two natures has taken place. Dioscorus says, I don't like that language. Um, I prefer what Eutychus is saying. And, and so they, cal they call this other council to Ephesus where you've got Flavian of Constantinople, um, which is where Nestorius was formerly reigning. And then you have Pope Leo of Rome, who is sending papal legates, he's sending representatives from Rome to this council. And Leo has written this tome and Dioscorus, he's somehow gets put in charge by the emperor of this whole second council of Ephesus in 449. And as Josh Hoffer, you just said, he refused to even have Leo's tome read. And Leo's tome was trying to help parse out the language of, of, the one person and two natures of Christ and what um, what can be said of the divine nature, what can be said of the human nature. So um, so we got we got all these powerful um, bishops in place that oversee numerous, not just a few churches, but regions of churches. And um, Dioscorus yeah. has the upper hand and gets his way at, at the Second Council of Ephesus. Yeah, the, and what becomes um, commemorated by, it's by history uh, in history as the robber synod they were calling i the robber synod was it was called that um uh right after the fact uh that this happened um yeah and, Le leo was not happy with the result pope leo was not happy with the results no I mean, you know Dioscorus, <laughs> a lot of people if, were if not he, if Dioscorus could have deposed leo he would have deposed leo too um i think he would have and uh mm -hmm. he he's he is firmly against flavian i mean flavian is is Leo's very supportive of Flavian's position and what Flavian did. And um, unfortunately, at the time that this happens, the the emperor in charge, who really holds the final sway, um, he's favorable towards Dioscorus's position. And so he, mm -hmm. he sides with Dioscorus, even though Leo appeals this. Because Flavian's, Flavian's removed from his position for holding what, according to Leo and what he had argued for, was the proper understanding uh, of, of uh, Christ Christology. And the thing is, the one of the things they cry out at Chalcedon when the Tome of Leo is read is that there's an, there's an uproar because they basically say, this is what Dioscorus hid. And he never should have. And mm -hmm. so there, it was really quite controversial that Leo had written specifically about this argument and Dioscorus chose purposefully to ignore it um, and, and uh, argue against it. And so you right. have a lot of division happening within uh, Christendom. Right. So Josh Hoffert, you're about to explain more about this Council of Chalcedon, Leo's Christology, and that contributes. Um, but before we do that, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsors. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Now, if you were to read that in Greek, you would know that Paul is not saying that you individually are the temple, but that you plural, that you all, that you guys make up the temple in which God's spirit dwells. Paul is making an appeal to the unity of church that we collectively make up the dwelling place of God's spirit. This is one of many places in the New Testament where we really can miss something if we're just reading it in English. With Kairos Classroom, you can learn Greek. Join a real teacher and real classmates in a live online classroom and learn how to read and study the New Testament in its original language. Real learning happens in community. Sign up for a class right now. And we're back with our discussion on the Council of Chalcedon. So uh, Josh Hoffert, you left off before a little break there that um, the Council of, of, of we're, we're getting into the Council of Chalcedon um, and two years prior, 449, we had the Council of Ephesus headed up by, uh, by the Bishop of Alexandria or the Bishop of the, uh, the Egyptian churches, uh, um, Dioscorus. He, um, he got his way. He, he did not allow Leo's tome to be read and Leo's understanding of the divine and human natures and the one person of Christ. Um, but as you just mentioned right before we left off, um, when they read Leo's tome, they meet two years later at the Council of Chalcedon. They, they actually do read Leo's tome this time. 
And I mean, there's an outcry, there's an uproar saying, this is what Dioscorus was hiding from us. So um, tell us a little bit more about Leo's tome, his Christology, and how that contributed to the Council of Chalcedon. Yeah, well, the first thing to know is that the, the uh, I think I alluded to this last week, is that um, the term tome I find misleading um, because it is, <laughs> it, is, it, is it, it is a very short work. And it's, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, it, it, Leo's tome is not, it doesn't necessarily introduce anything new. Uh, we'll get into the communication of idioms, which is probably its, its greatest contribution to the Christological um, argument. Uh, but mm -hmm. really, it's, it's restating a bunch of things that have already been stated. And um, it's not, I mean, you could mistake a lot of the statements he makes for something Cyril would write or something, even, even going back to Athanasius and Augustine, things that they would write. Um, so it, it's, it, is, it is really just saying, it, it, it doesn't really put itself forward as, um, you know, like say Cyril's on the unity of Christ, he goes through all of the arguments against his position and, and seriously refutes each one of them. Leo doesn't go out set out to do that with a tome. He's just setting out, this is how we think, right. and this is what the Nicene Creed hands us. And so it really is, it, it's a profound document, but it really is a, a simple summation of this is, this is orthodox understanding of the human and the divine and how those things play out in the life of Christ. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a fascinating document, which we're going to get into the particulars of that um, in just a few minutes. So what happens with the, the uh, Council of Chalcedon, which actually was originally supposed to be called in Nicaea, um, is uh, Theodosius, who's the emperor in favor of Dioscorus, and affirms uh, Dioscorus's decisions to, um, to ostracize, to remove Flavian and the bishops that agree with the formula of union. Um, you know, it's one way to get your ways to just kick everybody out. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, selected invites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not present the best argument, but just right, say right. all the people that disagree with me that this is like what my kids do. Um, it, and again, it, it goes back to we, sh we today looking back at things like this, we ought to expect better of our leaders. You know, if your pastor has a problem with, Oh, we won't go there. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave. Not, we'll leave the audience we'll to leave, decide how we'll that's going to work out in to your own context. That. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. I uh, think but, on the, uh, on the other hand, though, um, it is true that there could have been a lot more uh, Christian charity and humility in some of these debates. Yes, I, I, I think that it does reflect a passion for being precise mm -hmm. and correct in our theology. Yeah. Uh, right. That, that we've lost in a, a lot of parts of Christianity today, where we say, uh, you know, we'll, we'll use pious sounding phrases to kind of brush all these things off to the side. Well, you know, it's all about Jesus. Okay. Right. Well, that doesn't really shut down the need to, you know, to, to understand these things. It's, it's just fascinating how passionate these guys were uh, right. about getting it right. And how far they were willing to go, and how much they were willing to to, to suffer, uh, even from each other, to to put forward their position. Right. No, and I I think that's great, Father Ron. I think too that you know they were willing to take a stand, and yeah. on on an, on something Saul is deeply important. Uh, not only just on on you know are we getting are we are we let's argue about who who's right here. They wanted to be right because of, of the implications that it had on salvation, because of the implications it had on our relationship to Christ, on what, what it, on how we're understanding the scriptures. And so that's what I appreciate, even though you do see some things that are quite alarming, you know, how they, how they deal and some of the things that went on these guys. I mean, Dioscorus at Ephesus, I mean, he brought in like a mob of monks and military leaders, you know, to make sure that, um, <laughs> that his way was the way it ended, you know? So you're just like, wow, what, what happened there? But what I appreciate just on, on all ends here is that you had guys that were willing to take a stand willing to say, no, this, this really matters here. Um, and I think that's something important for us today. What are the things? Yes, we, we want to have unity with the body of Christ. We want to keep the main thing, the main thing. But when it, when it boils down to it, when we're really unpacking the scriptures, the conclusions that we come to, they have implications. And um, we, need, we need some Christian leaders 
with some real backbone in yeah. the church today that are willing to take a stand on things. Yeah, you know, in and in one sense, um, today, comparing comparing the way we talk about things today to the way they talked about things then, I mean, the 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 for one, the threat of death was much more present um, to someone in fifth century Rome or Constantinople or Alexandria or Antioch. Um, I mean, just from just from the contentiousness that would arise and uh, um, riots happening in the city, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. The threat of death for us today, I mean, let alone the 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 way we can treat uh, medical issues and that kind of stuff today, is we're less threatened by our mortality today than than ever in the history of humanity. Mm -hmm. And so, when when you are threatened with your mortality on a constant basis, you do think a lot more about what matters. Yes, and, <laughs> and so point. these guys, it, it's not just that they're going. Well, let's just argue. We like arguing like a philosopher. They're they're thinking this is issues of salvation. This right. is issues of who who gets over the line. This is issues of how we if, we if we don't think rightly about God, where are we as a church? Where are we going? And we're responsible for these people that could die at any moment under our watch. And mm -hmm. so it is it is it, it puts things in a um, a clear perspective as to why it was so important for them to argue that. And it still should be for us today, but unfortunately, because, you know, we're, we don't really have to think about our mortality nearly as much and nearly as, as uh, well, I love, that's one of the things I love about the Desert Fathers, because there's there's a number of, of part of their rhythm of life was uh, to make a covenant with your mind that you'll be dead in three days. And in doing that, it really puts into clarity what's that's a, important that's extremely intense you make a covenant with your mind wow, that's, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah. or or they'd practice something called the remembrance of death so uh, on juxtaposed with the remembrance of god his goodness his beauty and all that remembrance of death was you're going to die remember that right. every day exactly uh, or, Te or, number your days teach us exactly, to number our days exactly yeah. exactly it's, a, it's we literally actually, scriptural yeah right when you think about the fact that you're going to die one day it you order your life differently um, yeah yeah. No, that's good. So so we're at the Council of Chalcedon. So at 449, we had the Council of Second Council of Ephesus led by Dioscorus. He gets his way. Flavian of Constantinople is deposed. Um, and then um Rome doesn't like it. A lot of others don't like it. So uh, another another council is called in 451, the Council of Chalcedon, to to resolve these issues. And Leo's tome plays a really key role here. So um Josh, tell us a bit more about Leo's Christology and the Council of Chalcedon. Yeah, the um, ex like we had already said, Leo's tomes read out, and mm -hmm. um, the uh, this is. I'll just read this. This is what this is how important this document became. I, I'm just going to point out too. I think it was B.J. Allen um, in the comments had said that he printed out on Game Facts a, a uh, walkthrough for Mario Three. Yeah, Super Mario Brothers three, <laughs> and it was much longer than Leo's tome, and that's very accurate. It would be. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> I was I was curious for that how that would land. <laughs> Once you mentioned Mario three, I was like, where is this going? I, yeah, <laughs> I like I like that comment. <laughs> Comparing uh, uh, Mario three uh, game facts to Leo's tome. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, but which one was more important to you, BJ Allen? That's yeah, really just as mind blowing, yeah. you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so the, the council of Chalcedon is called in 451. Uh, and actually Theodosius, the emperor had passed away. And so when the, the new emperor came in Marcion, who was favorable towards Leo. And so when Leo petitioned Marcy and Marcy and agreed to call the council because this issue is still contentious, we need to address this. And so um, 500 bishops come together. That I, I was probably the biggest meeting since Nicaea, I would imagine. Um, I it might even been bigger than Nicaea. I don't know that Nicaea was 500. No, it um, certainly wasn't. The, uh, it, the, the the largest estimate, which is probably more of a symbolic number from the Old Testament was 313. Um, right. It could have been as little as 200 to 250, but definitely not 500. No, no, no. This was a yeah. massive council. Yes, yes. Um, so the, it does represent a large, I mean, larger than you had seen at any point up until this. Uh, up until this. Uh, not that everybody agreed with it. I mean, there's still, there was, in Leo's tome, there were essentially three questions that uh, people had problems with. 
um, they wanted to they wanted to clarify the the of two natures. I can't remember all three of them. I don't have them written down in front of me. But there were three questions that there were bishops that were going. Can you clarify this? Can you clarify this? Can you clarify this? And so when those three issues were resolved, everybody was really happy with Leo's tome, and they were resolved. There was one of the statements that they had read in an earlier version of the tome that wasn't in the later version. Can you clarify this? Um, and uh, so once the things were clarified to the bishops. They, they, the resounding cry that goes out is something like this. Um, the, the bishops cry out, this is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the apostles. So we all believe, thus the Orthodox believe. Anathema to him who does not thus believe. This is the one I love. I love this line. It's so memorable and catchy. Peter has spoken thus through Leo. I love that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so taught the apostles, piously and truly did Leo teach. So taught Cyril. Everlasting be the memory of Cyril. Leo and Cyril taught the same thing. Again, they're they're Leo and Cyril in what they're doing are addressing two different um overemphases and and doing it with the same Christological uh consensus. And so Leo's of course coming against the the one nature after two natures and uh, Cyril is coming against the two natures of Nestorius. Um and how do we properly think through that? Uh, so what what the what the council eventually adopts as they argue through these things uh, is the Leo, is the Nicene Creed again becomes central to it. Read the Nicene Creed. We affirm the faith of the Nicene Creed, and uh, they read Leo's tome and Cyril's letters, and these are codified as the orthodox understanding of Trinitarian theology. Not Trinitarian theology. It is Trinitarian theology, but the nature of Jesus, basically. Right. And and the ultimate resting place is the language of two natures, one person. The big difference between the Council of Chalcedon and the formula of union is a prepositional change, basically. Mm -hmm. And it's the change from of two natures to, in Chalcedon, it's in two natures. And uh, Matt, do you, you sound like you might have been had something to say with that? No, I think when we, maybe more when we get to it, that's um, to be clear. It's that, a big change. It's a big thing. Right, right. The formula of union left some room for interpretation there, that a union of two natures has taken place. Chalcedon very explicitly says he exists or he is acknowledged in two, like that he currently has two natures. And so, um, again, of two natures, it, it's it's a little unclear. Does he still have two natures? <laughs> you know, is it right. now one? You know, did, was it two before and now it's one? But Chalcedon is very explicit to say no. He is as as after at the incarnation and currently today, as he's seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus Christ is exists in two natures: divine yeah. nature and human nature. And, and rightfully so to be concerned about it because the of two nature statements, what led to Eutychus going, well, now he's one nature because he was of two natures. So right, there was right. a, there's a natural assumption that he made based on how he read it. And and that's the, the kind of problems you're going to find after Chalcedon are how people read Chalcedon. And whether they mm -hmm. disagree with Chalcedon completely or if they read it as not going far enough to condemn Nestorianism. They're, they're one of the arguments afterwards is it still gives room for Nestorianism, that you can still talk about in two natures that Jesus is, is you know, the fear is that Jesus is two separate sons. And, mm -hmm. and so that fear is always there. Chalcedon, I think, does a very good job of talking about that. But that was still a fear that was present in certain people uh, with Chalcedon. Mm -hmm. So Leo, just to go through a couple, uh, a couple points that Leo makes um, to sum up uh, what he teaches in the Tome. Um, uh, Leo teaches that the taking on of the human nature uh, was for the purpose of restoring mankind, uh, was the pur purpose of vanquishing death, and for the purpose of wresting control away from the devil, that that essentially to Leo, and this is this is again, it's not a new, this isn't a new thought with Leo, that the taking on of human nature was for the effect of redeeming human nature. That when when Leo approaches the idea of Jesus assuming human nature, and Matt talked about this in the episode a couple of weeks ago with Apollinaris, is when the Bible says he took on flesh, that term flesh does not literally just mean a body. That means the he took on everything that it meant to be human, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. And this go ahead. 
Wrong. Well, I was just going to say this. This was something that was addressed all the way back at the Council of Nicaea, because right. one of the one of the early creeds that they were looking at as as a template, if you will, uh, talked about you know the Jesus Christ being you know the Word made flesh or God made flesh, and the Council Fathers altered that uh, to what it is today, which is uh, he he became man. Born of the Virgin okay. Mary, he became man, and that change of word was specifically for the reason you're talking about, so that he doesn't just have skin, bones, and and muscle, but that he is a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we'll get into this too. It the the reason it it's not even just that he took on um, the human experience, but in a way. Um, he took on all of humankind in taking on human flesh. And this is, yeah. this is one of the things I love about uh, uh, the way Leo talks about this. Um, the, and, and he goes on, he, the, he says that the uniqueness of the birth of Jesus does not remove his human properties, which of course was um, directly refuting what Eutychus was teaching was, Eutychus said Jesus became one nature. Essentially, the divine overtook the human nature, and you just have God with skin on, um, and you don't really have an actual human in front of you. You just have this and 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 embodied God, but no real human qualifications. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that's significant, ahead. Josh, because it, what's what they want to uphold is the fact that you know this Jesus Christ is true God, that he has. He has a divine nature, everything proper, everything that it means to be God, Jesus has, because he is he's God. The word was with God. The word was God, John 1, 1. But the scriptures also talk about Jesus being thirsty, you know, being tired, um, being weary, right. at the, uh, being hungry, um, suffering on the cross, bleeding, you know, dying and uh, uh, being buried and rising again. So it's it's. What Leo is doing here, he, he's, he's saying that, look, all of these, everything that pertains to being human, Jesus Jesus experienced as a human being. And um, these, these, these tired, uh, ti uh, being tired and thirsty and hungry, suffering and dying, all of those things are proper to his human nature. Yeah, he, he, he writes um, in regards to that. He says, for though the Holy Spirit imparted fertil fertility to the virgin, Yet a real body was received from her body, and 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 I love how um, there's uh, firmly rooted in Old Testament uh, interpretation and New Testament interpretation. Uh, and he says, "And wisdom building her how her a house, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us." Quoting two different scriptures, that is in that flesh which he took from man and which he quickened with the breath of a higher life. Mm -hmm. And so you've got fully man being quickened by the life of God. Um, absolutely right and yes. that he received this flesh from mary it wasn't yes. a heavenly human nature and that's what apollinaris taught is that, that, that yeah. it was some kind of almost you know argue this is not the word he used but arguably um you can interpret him as saying is that he's a he's a sort of jesus sort of superhuman you know he has a, a heavenly human nature no leo's saying here the flesh the human nature that jesus received he received directly from a jewish woman Named Mary. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so next point, um, that in the, uh, Leo taught that in the very, in the very fact of the union between the divine and the human, um, you see Christ mediating between God and man. The mediation mm -hmm. between God and man happens because of the assumption of human flesh because Christ was both divine and human. And so, and one of the things I love about anchoring the mediation there, because in our present evangelical theology, you know, pertinent to me, at least, not everybody here is not evangelical, um, everybody listening, at least, um, the, we generally anchor that on the death of, uh, on the death of the cross. And mm -hmm. I love that Leo anchors it in the very fact of the assumption 
that the mediation happens because of who Jesus was. And he reconciled within himself, God and man. And by becoming God and man in the same body, we in, in because of that, because of the nature of who he is as a human, we are brought into something. And, and naturally the, I'm not denigrating the cross, of course, that's absolutely part of the, the whole equation. Um, but Leo sees it as the totality of the person as, as mediating between the two. Um, and I, you know, that was one, that was in, in studying Leo and then Cyril as well, that, that concept just blew my mind because mm -hmm. that's why redemption is so important. Understanding that the, the, the way to think about Christ and what scripture gives us is it's not just that Jesus died, that, that grants us access to the father. It's that he came that grants us access to the father that brings us back that's to good. the father. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, uh, you know, the soteriology uh, on display here and in other writings of the fathers as in the councils uh, is as opposed to Josh, what you talked about of, you know, just strictly focusing on the, on the cross uh, almost to the exclusion of everything else. It's as if the incarnation is just sort of a prelude. Uh, right. You know, Jesus became man just so he could go to the cross and die. Um, and of course, Nobody comes out and says that explicitly, but I think in a lot of popular devotional piety, that's how it works out. Uh, whereas mm -hmm. with the fathers, everything is rooted in the in incarnation. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's almost like they just can't, they, they don't want to go beyond that, just park there, because that's such an incredible reality that, that God became man in order to reconcile us to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I want to do a little time check for us, gentlemen. We've got about four minutes here. Um, so, Josh, you just you take us through these these main points that you want to hit before we go. And I know we yeah. probably want to say something about the creed, the the Chalcedonian definition itself. Yeah. Uh, yes. Absolutely. I'll I'll go through these quickly. Um, the uh, point. The next point. Uh, there was in 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 Leo's Christology. There's a demonstrable effect upon humankind. Um, simply by the perfect union of divine and human in Jesus. Um, and so, the, again, like I had said, it, the, the conversation about humanity in Jesus' seeming humanity is really an ontological conversation about humanity. Uh, and not, in, not ontological in the sense that we're all, all of humanity now is saved in a universal salvation sense. Um, but every, all of humanity has now been invited into this divine union and the, right. the, the method of that, of course, is death, repentance, you know, death, death of the old nature, repentance, salvation, indwelling Holy Spirit, all of that. Um, but humankind has been radically impacted by um, uh, the very fact of the assumption um, that and then to to Leo, Jesus, Jesus is really the forerunner of the new birth experience, if you will. Absolutely. Um, he, he made he made what was invisible visible this is and this is this is an you know just a a point i i think i may have started to make last week is that when you consider the the formula of jesus being fully god and fully man and that in no way um uh well actually we'll get to that in just a second um it was just i'll harp on it in a second um the the immeasurable majesty of god may have been obscured because it was it was at the Mount of Transfiguration that um, Peter, James, and John see the glory of God in the person of Jesus right there. But not everybody saw that at every given moment. But so it's obscured in a sense that you can't see it clearly. But it's not diminished by his role as a human by taking on the mm -hmm. form of a servant. Right. So he has. Uh, he, there, his, is there's no less divinity in no. in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's he's he's in a way veiled himself by the taking on of human flesh. But the transfiguration to your point is an example where we're really, we get it. We, Peter, James and John get a glimpse of this is what the, the one who is, is true God and true man and his divine nature is shining through his human nature in a very visible yeah. and apparent way, um, which is just a foretaste of, of really, what we're going to witness face to face with Jesus in the, in the next That's right. age. He wasn't, Ugh. well, let's put it this way. 
and maybe this will be a controversial statement. Mm -hmm. I can stir something up with, with just a minute or so left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll just, we'll just call another council next week. You know? if, if, if you paid attention to what he was doing over time, like the apostles did disciples at that point, they come to their own interpretation, their own conclusion that this is God among them. They 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 don't need him to say I am God among you. They come to their own conclusion of that. He says, Peter, what do you see? What do you say that I am? When Jesus calms the wind and the waves, they look at him and say, What manner of man is this? They're completely stunned by the fact that he was doing the very things that Israel's God claimed that he could do. Right. So so the it's not it's not so much that in being veiled he was unrecognizable. It's in being right. veiled what what through the Pharisees was not his ability to work wonder working power it was his humility oh, okay all right sorry for the uh technical difficulties folks it waited quite a long time to happen uh this week but i think we're going to get everybody back on here in just a minute uh, and so there we go there there's josh i'm back <laughs> and matt yeah we're uh, yeah joe was just getting spicy i see that from terry <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> josh lewis said that's too controversial i'm cutting this all <laughs> <That's laughs> right. this episode right now <laughs> well you know i was thinking about this the other day just just the other day i was i, I was preaching in my church on sunday and i was just i was thinking about it my my church has got a steady diet in the last couple of weeks of um nestorianism and Cyril Christology and all that because I've been doing so much um, uh, studying on this. Uh, so anyway, um, for Jesus to truly say to the Pharisees that you search the scriptures and are searching for me, but you don't, you didn't, I'm standing right in front of you. You know, this is John 5, I'm paraphrasing it, of course, but you search the scriptures and I'm standing right in front of you and you don't even see me, is mm. it, he wasn't so much, he wasn't so hidden that he was unrecognizable, but what they expected was not what they got. Mm -hmm. And they expected a, a God that looked like them that was going to come and tell everybody they were wrong and kill everybody and make them the, you know, the, the greatest nation that the world had ever known. But he came in humility in the form of a servant. And so, so in, in understanding what Leo's going after and what, what I, it's a real good um, check on some of our excesses within charismatic theology where, you know, for some reason we think that Christ, the language betrays that we actually talk about Christ being less than divine. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and we look at some of the things that Leo says here, what Cyril says, uh, and pulling apart scripture, you know, they're not just creating these things out of thin air. Um, that it, he says that in, in point, um, next point is, uh, Leo says each nature does what is proper to it. Uh, the natures are united, but they care all, and they carry all of those properties in union. And so the, Christ was human and the human nature dies, but we can say that God dies because we can say the same thing about the human nature that we can say about the divine nature because they've been united in one person. And, um, and so the, each one is necessary for the process of redemption and for the plan of God, um, but each one does what's proper to it. So um, that's the language that he used. Uh, each one, he says, each form does what's proper to it with the cooperation of the other. Other, that is the word performing what, what appertains to the word and the flesh carrying out what appertains to the flesh. Um, mm -hmm. One of them sparkles with miracles, the other succumbs to injuries. Um, right. This is so interesting. We don't have time to go into a lot of this, but it, Leo is very explicit here that the miracles that Jesus performed were proper to his divine nature. Yes. Um, which has been and the reason that's important. It's, it's become quite popular and a lot of charismatic circles to say that you now that the miracles he performed are proper to his human nature as a man filled the Holy Spirit. Um, right. Is that absolutely heretical? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I just think it's a bit unclear. Um, and I think it's yeah. um, risks. Uh, um, it, it risks saying that somehow the divinity of Christ was diminished at the incarnation. Um, yeah. And there's, there's certain reasons that, um, Folks will say that they they want to make sure that that Matthew and Josh and Father Ron, you know, as human beings anointed by the Holy Spirit, can perform the same miracles that Jesus did. Um, but which I would affirm, but I don't think we have to deny the fact that it was His divinity that was sparkling, as Leo puts it, um, when He yes. calmed the waves, healed the sick, and cast out demons. 
Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things that happens within that is that um, when when the he performed the miracles as a man filled with the Holy Spirit is then then the role of the Holy Spirit is empower you to become more is to empower you to become more spiritual and less emphasis then is placed on actually the role of the Holy Spirit is to work within you the same union that we see in Jesus and make mm -hmm. you like him. And so there's a broader purpose for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit than just, well, now you can pray and prophesy and work miracles. No, actually the Holy Spirit is working out the image of God within you. Yes. And, yes. and so, so it, to me, it diminishes the role of the Holy Spirit in working that divine nature within you. But when we bring it back to that, no, he, everything he accomplished, he accomplished as fully divine and fully human. Then we can start to anchor, okay, well, what does it mean then for the Holy Spirit to come to us? And how does that work out within us? And I, looking at things, Leo's tome has been really helpful personally for me to, to think through some of the implications of what, what I've just assumed. You know, it's funny when you start reading the church fathers, you see how much stuff you just assumed about your Christology. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, I don't know. All right. I keep, I keep taking you down, <laughs> down a couple of rabbit trails here. Uh, you got, you got three, uh, well, let's, three points let's left throw out here. One, yeah. Let's throw out one, one more of those points um, because okay. of the time. And uh, or do we still have father Ron around? Yeah, I'm, I'm in. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes he, he mystically transports. <laughs> uh, that wasn't an attack against Father Ron. I'm just really glad that he's able to, uh, that we, we haven't gone so far that uh, he's had to run off to another thing, um, is, is the communication of idioms. Mm -hmm. And because that's one of, that's a, an, a very important part of uh, Leo's, uh, Leo's Christology. And, what you know he it, it's it goes back to even what cyril did when he really got under nestorius's skin by saying we say that um god died we say that god sat on the um the lap of mary and was suckled as a baby and nestorius and the and uh, some of the other antiochian bishops were really really uncomfortable with that language um uh, and uh, but he says leo says and this is what's affirmed by chalcedon is uh, we can affirm, for example, because this is the, the communication of idioms basically means what you say about the divine, you can say about the human, what you say about the human, you can say about the divine, because they exist within one person, one substance, one subsistence. So he says, we can affirm, for example, that the Son of God was crucified and buried, and also that the Son of Man came down from heaven, because we're talking about one person, not two. We're talking about one identity, not two. We're talking mm -hmm. about one one. Uh, thing not to. And so what we say about one, we can say about the other so that we don't. So, and this is important to, to begin to calm the debate over, well, you're talking about two separate entities. And he says, if you're saying it about the son of God, you can say it about the son of man. If you're saying it about the son of man, you can say it about the son of God, because it's one person, it's not two. And this starts to this, this, I think this really hammers home. This is, this is Leo's real, real contribution to this argument. He had made a lot of our contributions, but the communication of idioms is an incredible contribution to how we talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we have the Chalcedonian definition here. Um, and there's some key phrases. We don't have time to, to unpack all this, but as you already mentioned before, Josh Offert, um, there is, it affirms, it affirms some things that we already heard about, that we already affirmed at the formula of union. It affirms one and the same son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it affirm. I mean, there's a lot, I won't go line by line here, but it affirms the Theotokos. It affirms that Mary can truly be called the bearer of God, the God bearer, that she carried God in the flesh in her womb. Um, therefore we can call her Theotokos. Um, and then it's, it keeps emphasizing this one and the same Christ to be acknowledged in two natures. Um, and I just think that language is super key there. Um, is there anything else you want to add there of, uh, or pick out or father on just notable language of this Chalcedonian definition? Well, I think, uh, one of the things that sticks out to me, uh, based on what Josh was just talking about with the communication of idioms is, uh, th these expressions inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, mm -hmm. inseparably, 
uh, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union. Uh, so it, it really walks this careful and precise line of saying that the two natures are distinct. They're not mixed. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they are inseparably, unchangeably uh, united. Uh, and of course, mm -hmm. it, 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 it's still mind-blowing, but, but nonetheless, it's, right. it's a precision that just wasn't present in any of the earlier attempts to hammer this out. And, right. and you know, therein lies the mystery, really is they've, they've, they've kind of narrowed everything down to this point that says, this is the thing we can't explain. There's all the language we can talk about around it, that we know there's a union and we know that union exists and we saw it in Jesus and we know he's both fully God and fully man, but how that union, it's, you know, inconfusedly unchanged, every single word that we can throw out there to try and, to try and give you to talk about it and and i at the at the core essence of it it is a mystery and mm -hmm, that's why mm -hmm. as, as father ron said it's mind-blowing and all these other ways of trying to work it out were eutychus just going well he just became fully god like the, the humanity was gone right you've taken away the mystery then of the union and to and then nestorianism you go well there are just two of them in there and uh and so you've taken away the mystery of that but when you come down to Chalcedon, Chalcedon preserves in specific, accurate language that harkens back to scripture, harkens to Cyril and harkens to Leo. We've harkened back to it and we can go, this is where the mystery lies and we can't go beyond that. And mm -hmm. every, all these other constructions, you know, Apollinarius, Valentinus, all these other ones went beyond that. Arius himself goes, right, when we go back to Nicene, goes beyond the mystery to try and explain it but herein lies the mystery that's inexplicable beyond saying we know they're there we know they're distinct but we know they're not different and mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. different in the sense of separate right and so it's it's creating some boundary lines in our language yeah here's here's what we don't want to say here but it's still preserving to your point josh the sense of mystery is it yeah this how exactly this the this union between divine and human works is is beyond us but what we do know is that that the divine and the human have not been confused they haven't been mixed together and we've got some divine human hybrid half god half human demigod thing going on we know there's not changed right. the divine has not changed in this we know that they won't it's be not, divided. he's not hercules he's not hercules. right that's exactly or something right exactly yes. and we know they don't act inseparably we know that it's yeah. not you know the 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 word of the eternal word of god makes a decision and then you know he does he performs a miracle and then you know the son of david jesus just kind of hanging out no inseparably the divine human natures act together you've got the the human hand of jesus touching somebody and the divinity of christ <laughs> working in full cooperation with his human nature to yeah. see that person healed i love that yeah mm -hmm. and and i think that uh it just sort of goes to the point that what the fathers were doing uh, in the, the promulgation of these creeds, the Chalcedonian definition, is that while they are trying to be precise, uh, Josh, I, I like your phrase, that they preserved the mystery, they keep the mystery intact. They're not trying to, uh, you know, explain these mysteries fully. They're trying to exclude heresy. Mm -hmm. Really, they're, yeah. they're just putting boundaries around orthodoxy. They're not mm -hmm. saying this is all there is to say on this matter. Uh, they just say this far and no further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, we're at um, we're at five fourteen here. Josh Lewis, do we have a question or two we want to try to address before we close out? Uh, yeah, if you guys are in the chat, y'all can feel free to drop your questions in. We can up a few of these let me just see if i can type in questions as always we like to lose all of our questions when the internet goes out um <laughs> right, right this is a this is a question from sarah uh sarah asked a question would the lack of passion of theology be linked to a lack of knowledge of church history or the emphasis of only scripture reading i think this addresses two things that happen often in protestantism one of them uh, being that protestants love the sola scriptura 
uh, side of things, and that can often be misconstrued as only Scripture, Scripture apart from history, Scripture apart from theology, and I'm just going to read Scripture in my, my bunker with my interpretation right. rather than the, the scope of, of history. Uh, and then the other has a bit to do with the passion of theology. How would you guys answer uh, the role of church history when it comes to theology and biblical literacy? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I have thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go so, for it. Go um, for it. yeah, I, I wouldn't directly connect a lack of passion to a lack of knowledge about history. I mean, you see, you see people that that really read the fathers very little, but are very passionate about their particular interpretation of the scriptures. Um, I think, I think for me personally, just a a deeper understanding of of church history and of the of historical theology what the church has, has taught and argued and debated over the centuries. Um, it, it helped for me, it helps me as a reader say, what, what were they, why were they so passionate about this? Um, and it invites me into that conversation and it has me think about other questions that may be circulating in my own mind or in the church today. And so I think it, um, it, it definitely can contribute to making us more passionate about a particular subject. Um, and I think that's for me as well is when I see certain theological arguments happening today that people are pretty passionate about. But um, um, some of this is is kenosis theory, for example, and understanding of Philippians two and what it meant for um, the eternal word to empty himself and take on the form of slave. Or um, this uh, arguments about you know is the um, eternal subordination of the son. I'm very passionate about these subjects because church history has something to say about it. And if we divorce ourselves from our from the history of Christianity and how we've talked about these kinds of subjects, um, we're 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 leaving ourselves prone to fall into um, into into theological error. I believe, just to say bluntly, and to and to not consider why these subjects are, uh, the claims that we make about these types of subjects, we're not thinking through all of these implications that the earlier fathers, they, they thought about. So um, I definitely think um, it will, it can increase our passion about certain areas um, in a big way, but it isn't necessarily the contingent for passion about a theological subject. This question's come in a couple of times mm -hmm. by uh, the Grace Cast. He's asking a question about Lutheran theology. It's the first time I've ever heard about this specific thing. Uh, Lutherans, are they Eutychians like the Reformed uh, claim, which I'm assuming his definition of Reformed is Calvinistic soteriology, because the Lutherans were a part of the Reformation uh, quite a bit. So uh, uh, one might even say they started it. Uh, anyway, uh, or are the Reformed, I would again interpret that as particular Calvinist, uh, hold to an historian like the Lutherans accuse them of. So it does seem as if within the Reformed tradition, you have the, the Calvinistic brothers who lean more on Calvinism, in particular redemption, and then you have your Lutheran brothers who are going to to differ on their soteriological beliefs as well, but but do you guys know anything about this? Is the first time I've been ever hearing about this. I'm not familiar with I've, this debate yeah, at all. I've not heard about. I've not heard of that one before. So <laughs> this I, this uh, I think to be clear that the Lutherans and the reformers, um, the main a lot of them, as far as I know, Lutheran Luther and Calvin. I can't remember Zwingli. He was another prominent reformer, but they aff they affirmed the Council of Chalcedon, um, which rejected both. Nestorianism and Eutychianism. Um, so the accusation about being Nestorian or or Eutychian came out in their Eucharistic theology, and so um, and and it kind of came out at both oh, ends because you have I see it you now. have you have the Lutheran yeah. and Luther was very Luther used the incarnation as a focal point for understanding the what happens when the bread and wine are consecrated in the liturgy, you know? Um, and so it, on, on Luther's point of, um, if I'm remembering correctly, says something to the effect of in, in the same way as, you know, Christ can be fully God and fully man at the same time. Um, so the Eucharistic bread, <laughs> we can say, can be fully, truly bread and truly body of Christ um, the real true body of Christ, but also real true bread as we know it at the exact same time. And so, um, 
So the I debate's think... not really over their formulation of who um, Christ is, but the, the connection between the table and saying, hey, mm-hmm. this is the bread and the wine, uh, the presence of God is upon in beneath around the elements where calvin will say there's like this mystical union uh of the spirits really present somehow mystically with the elements uh th- those kinds of articulations are how they're pigeonholing each other to say well if you say this is the body and, and you're using this kind of articulation you must then infer this on the nature of christ so it's not their actual formation of christology but the way that it flushes right. out into their communion theology Exactly, exactly. Interesting. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, I am not seeing any other questions, but again, there could have been phenomenal questions before our outage, but for whatever reason, that's just a thing. And guys, I apologize every time it happens. We've been working on it. We've gotten, I'm going to have to upgrade the internet to fiber right before Michael leaves to go to Oklahoma. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, uh, uh, that's all that I've got question wise in here. Do you guys have any closing thoughts? Pass it over to you. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would offer, um, (laughs) a number of different thoughts. I don't, how long to go is really what it comes down to. Um, though the argument, I don't know, I ultimately looking through these things, I'm not even sure that, um, the best way of ironing out all these things is just to say, this is the way you need to believe now believe this way. And, um, you know, it doesn't really allow for process for growth, for transformation, all of those kind of things. So one of the things that I love in being able to study through this and learn through this is to see the various different outworkings of how, how these creeds and councils, impacted the greater body of Christendom and uh, they a lot of times they left things in disarray and and I I can't help but look through these things and go I wish there would have been a more tender touch to how we addressed these I wish there would have been a more pastoral heart here I wish there would have been a, um, a greater commitment to walk together here and you know you can see those same things today and I'm not saying that they shouldn't have had these conversations. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have had the councils or, or codified the creeds or anything like that, because I, I firmly look at these and go, um, I, I need these to give me language and structure for how I live my life in union with Christ today. And, um, and to say, as, as we said kind of pejoratively earlier today or earlier in the stream that, well, we only need Jesus uh, and pe- and how people can make that claim. Why do you look at these kind of things? Because these absolutely inform me about, they've given all of Christendom a lens for how, how I see the nature of Christ playing out in scripture and playing out in my life. And so I absolutely need them, but I can't help but look and on some level be disappointed um, that, that, sometimes power got in the mix sometimes politics got in the mix sometimes and and maybe it's just this maybe human humanity gets in the mix and and oftentimes we look at these things these arguments these these going back and forths and just go um can we take a step back and and see see that person on the other side of the aisle for what they're trying to say and um you know i i if someone had said to Eutychus, hey, what's going on in your heart, man? And Eutychus might have just gone, I'm really scared that these guys are going to reject me. So I'm trying to find the language to make sure that I'm saying the right thing. Uh, you know, hypothetically, I don't know Eutychus or anything like that, but I'm just saying a tender touch. And, um, you know, I can't help but wish that you saw that more often in the way that Christians argue today and the way that Christians um, combat today. That a desire to understand and a, de- a desire to reach out and desire to uh, walk together and to honor the other person and to see the other person as um, someone made in the image of God who Christ loves and absolutely adores, regardless of whether they're right or wrong or you're right or wrong. And um, so my appeal to the body would be, um, let's find a way to love one another and find a way to humble yourself. The greatest, the greatest catalyst for spiritual growth is humility. Um, there's no other greater catalyst for spiritual growth than humility, according to Scripture. Humble yourself, and Christ will exalt you. 
Um, so my appeal to the body of Christ is let's humble ourselves when we come to places of disagreement and commit to walking together, loving one another and laying ourselves down for one another. That's good. That's good. Yeah. I think, you know, what I love about studying this is, you know, you think of it, it causes you to think very carefully and deeply. Um, what are the, what are the implications of the word of God of taking up humanity? Um, what, how does that, what does that show about the humility of God to be, um, to take on human flesh in a way that you have God in the flesh, in the womb of, of, of a Jewish virgin for nine months, that of a, a humble God who is, um, who, from whom we receive every need that we have in life um, as the one who needed to be fed by his mother, as the one who needed to be, who had to learn how to walk, the one who had to learn how to speak, the one who had to, I just, I love this, um, this powerful scene in 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 the chosen, where uh, um, season two, where Mary, you know, they're they're talking to this is a completely um, not in the Bible discussion, but I think it captures something very biblical. Is that Mary? The biggest shock to her and surprise to her was when she gave birth to the Son of God. It's that he needed her, and the way she says that, I mean, it just I think it really captures the, the heart of the biblical narrative here. Is that um, God? took on the form of a slave for us and for our salvation. And that isn't only something he did, but it's something that radically changed our, our, our nature to redeem us from sin, to cleanse us from sin and to elevate us into sharing in his divine life. And that is what I love about this. And I think the council of Chalcedon, I think, and the, in all the debates that are going on here and Leo's Christology, especially, I think, help us start to touch that the beauty of that mystery of God becoming man. And well, those are my I thoughts. Guess, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Father, Father Ron is gone. So I was like, yeah, that, yeah, those yeah. are all good thoughts. All That's good all thoughts. right. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, again, Please remember to if uh, uh, to like this video, to subscribe to our channel. You can get updates about our upcoming episodes. We're shifting into a new subject next month on on a lot of sacramental theology about the the spiritual and the earthly realm meeting together in 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 um, in the practice of the sacraments, but also um, getting into some interesting things about uh, about uh, casting out demons and, <laughs> and the manifestation of the of the of the life of God. Um, in in the world today, and so how the fathers right. thought about the the spiritual and, and material realm meeting together, and other. Uh, so please join us next week. Please join us this coming month, and have a great week and share this video with a few friends.